Hey, my name is Michael Lodge, and I'm the speaking pastor here at Cascade Community Church. And I'm so glad that you found this video, and I hope that it helps you understand the love of God and draws you into living life with Him. But I want to encourage you, don't let this be a substitute for being plugged into the local body. Wherever you are, find that connection. And if you're here in Monroe, we cannot wait to live life with you at church. So come and get plugged in. We worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. Cause he opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. Oh my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord.
Welcome to Cascade Church. My name is Joel and I'm the missions pastor here. I'm so glad that you're watching today. If this is your first time connecting with us, would you fill out a digital connect card? There's a link in the description of this video. You can click on that to tell us more about you, ask questions and submit prayer requests. At the end of this month, a new season of men's and women's Bible studies kick off. Study groups are a great place to connect in a group setting where you can get to know people in a laid back environment and spend time in God's word together. Learn more and register on the website at cascadechurch.org. Also, there's a new ministry beginning soon. Beloved is a hope group for widowed and divorced women. It'll be a place for connection, encouragement, and fun. They're having a kickoff breakfast on Saturday, January 22nd here at Cascade Cafe. You can learn more about it and sign up to attend on the website or on the app. Finally, we're having an annual family meeting in Potluck on Sunday, February 6th, after the second service. Save this date in your calendars. We'll share a meal together, discuss church vision, and catch up on many ministry updates. You members will be able to vote on the 2022 budget, which will be mailed out to you. We hope to see you there. I'm so glad that you're here today. We are currently studying the Gospel of John, so let me just encourage you, grab your Bible, let's dig in. It's so good to be here with you today. Uh, open up to John chapter six. I'm excited for uh, what God is gonna be uh, leading us in. Uh, if you weren't here last week, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Uh, what it means for God to be the provider in our lives, that Jesus is enough. We talked about the enoughness of Jesus. And then last week, we talked about uh, fear, the storms of life and how Jesus addresses our anxiety. I really wanna encourage you, if you weren't here last week, if you didn't hear that, please go back and, and listen to that again. Uh, I shared a little personal story. For those of you who weren't here, I uh, found out just a couple of weeks ago that I have a, a little brain tumor uh, that I'm gonna have to have surgery hopefully early March. Uh, and as you can imagine, that caused just a little bit of anxiety in my life. We all have anxieties. Uh, and just hearing the way Jesus has walked all of us through that is, is just remarkable. And today we open up the Bible and, and we look at the end of chapter six, where Jesus kind of takes all of these events and then just immediately starts addressing the hearts of all the disciples, all the people around him. He has a, a DTR with him. Do you know what a DTR is? Okay, okay, someone laughed, okay, so yeah. Yeah, I was, me and my wife, we were hanging out with some, some friends uh, just uh, two nights ago uh, that we haven't been with in a while, uh, and they had never heard DTR before, and we were just kind of talking about our relationships. They've been married for five years uh, and are still kind of you know, getting to, to really deeply know each other, and, and he was astonished he was astonished. He actually presented this question to us. He's like, all right, now we have something we continue to come back to every couple of months. My friend Jerry is a super planner. Anyone else? Are you the super planner in your relationship? Raise your hands. No? Okay, wow. Only like a couple of super planners. How many of you are like the free floater of the relationship? Like you're just like, let's just go with whatever comes up. All right, so my friend Jerry was astonished because he is a super researcher. He's a super planner. And it blows his, wine, his mind that his wife has no interest in research, has no interest in planning. She's just like, wherever the wind blows, we'll go, we'll do that. And that just blows his mind. So he sat down with us and he was like, surely you both our planners. Michael, you like to study. Stacia, I know how intelligent you are. Come on, you're both planners, right? And he was amazed to find out that I am not a super planner. I am a free floater. Like I just let Stacia do all the planning, all of the research, all of the details. That's her. I'm not, anyone else relationship like that? Like you kind of balance each other out. There, there's two kinds of people. There's the super planner, and there's the free floater, right? That's pretty typical in relationships. There's two different kinds of people. Found that out when my parents came back in, like we had a little bit of a house divided. Uh, there are Coke people, and there are Pepsi people, right? Pepsi, 
God bless your souls. I don't know how you do it. Like I, I'm a Coke person. <laughs> My dad is a Pepsi person. There's two different kinds of people, Coke people, Pepsi people, maybe a third, the Dr. Pepper people. That's my wife. There are dog people and there are cat people, right? There are mountain people and there are beach people, right? There are the glasses half empty, the glasses half full, right? There are those that are completely okay with no resolution. So if you look at John chapter 6... Yeah, some people are going to be dying till the end of the service. If, if you look at John chapter 6, where, where John continually takes us, where Jesus continually takes us, if you were to ask John, the, the beloved disciple, this man that walked 2,000 years ago, walked with Jesus, listened to Jesus, followed Jesus, if you were to ask him, are there two types of people in this world? John would say, absolutely. And it's not Coke and Pepsi or dogs and cats. It's those who believe and those who do not believe. Now we open up the word right now and, and, and we start reading something where, where Jesus... Some people's perspective looking at this, Jesus makes the biggest leadership mistake of his career right here. Where just the day before, Jesus had thousands upon thousands of people cheering his name. He fed the 5,000, which was more like 10 to 12,000. He fed them miraculously and they wanted to take him by storm and make him king. They were shouting Jesus' name. Surely you are the savior, the Messiah, the redeemer. But they didn't really understand. And Jesus in this part of John chapter six has a DTR with all of the people. Where Jesus makes it clear, I, I, I want you to understand what it means to believe in me. Because either you believe in me or you don't. Some uncomfortable words for us to hear. But words that lead us to life. So, so open up to John chapter 6. We're going to start with verse 25. And this is where Jesus begins to make one of his great I am statements. So these people that Jesus just the day before fed Fed the 5,000, were looking for Jesus. Jesus ended up going up to Capernaum and, and, and it says the people looked for him where they were and saw that Jesus was not there, heard rumor that he had gone to somehow to Capernaum. They got in their boats. They went to Capernaum to find Jesus. And here in verse 25 is where we pick up the conversation. It says this, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now that words are so important, we're, we're gonna stop on so many words and phrases as we read a lot of verses as we go through this, but they refer to Jesus as rabbi. What does that mean of them? If Jesus is their rabbi, that means they belong to Jesus as his disciples. It means these thousands of people said that we wanna make you our rabbi. We are saying that we believe in you and Jesus turns to them immediately and asked them this question. He said, Rabbi, Rabbi, where did you, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, circle those words, truly, truly. Because this is where Jesus starts making clarifying, exclusive statements. This is the DTR, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. So Jesus has this quick DTR with the people, and he says, wait, 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 time out. You're, you're calling me rabbi, but why are you really here right now? And Jesus would be asking that same question of us right now as we sit here in church. He would look at us this morning and say, why are you really here? 
to these people, he says, you're only here because I gave you food yesterday. I'm your free meal giver. And that's the extent. Why are you really here? Because I have something true to say, something hard to say, something exclusive to say. Actually, right here where it says, for on him, God the Father has set his seal. That word seal is a Jewish word, amet. Amet, it means true. God has set his seal, his truth on Jesus. That, that word is made up of only three letters. The first letter of the alphabet, the middle letter of the alphabet, and the last letter of the alphabet. So the word truth says what is true in the beginning what is going to be true in the end, what is going to be true all throughout the middle of life. There is truth, one truth, a defined truth, an exclusive truth, and that truth has been placed only in one man. Do you hear that? The truth is Jesus. Jesus is saying, I am am the truth. God has placed that seal on me yesterday, today, and forever. What do you do with that truth, and, and how do you respond to that truth? Jesus goes on to say this. In verse 28, it says, then they said to him, well, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God. Now, now, it's very important to understand in context, you're in Capernaum right now. Jesus is, is standing in the synagogue. You look around Capernaum, and what you find, one of the major trade of Capernaum was making millstones, these giant stones. And, and, and you think of that famous scripture where Jesus says, if you mislead any of these children, it would be better for you to do what? He literally was pointing right outside the synagogue, take one of those big heavy rocks, tie it around your neck and jump in the sea. Jesus was very, he used illustrations. He used what was around him. The people of Capernaum were very familiar with bread making. And we talked about how this was the preparation time for the feast of Passover, a feast that centered around bread. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago as they were the feeding of the 5,000 and bread upon bread upon bread. And all over Capernaum, you would see these seals, these seals that had pictures of bread and a grapevine that was coming through it that spoke back to the time of Moses when Moses did the work of going to God and providing manna from heaven for the people. Moses was accredited with doing the work that paved the way for the manna to be given. So bread was on everyone's mind, here in Capernaum especially. And Jesus was saying that there is a work to do, but that work is this. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him. Circle that phrase, that you believe in him. You think of John chapter 20, verse 31, that that's one of the key verses you're gonna have it memorized by the time we get through John, which is gonna be about two and a half years from now, okay? You're gonna have it memorized. Where John said Jesus did all of these things, Jesus performed all of these miracles and said all of these things that you may know him and believe in him and by believing in him have eternal life. Belief, life. We've been talking about the goal that Jesus has here is to give us abundant life. And we've talked about how that's not just your heart beating, your lungs filling. Jesus isn't concerned just about you being alive. He wants to know that you are abundantly alive, eternally alive. The vibrancy of life. And he uses that word alive more than 55 times. So it's very important. You know that things are important when people repeat themselves all the time. Life, zeo, 55 times. The word believe, guess how many times it's in the Gospel of John? 95 times. 
Over and over again, John comes back to this point that Jesus came back to over and over and over again. Belief. Do you believe in the truth? Is that your response? Do you believe in the truth? This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? Are you for real, you knuckleheads? I just made bread out of nowhere yesterday and you're asking for another sign today? Well, the reason why they were asking this is that it was believed that when the Messiah came, he would do the same works that Moses did. So they looked at Jesus and were like, bro, you're gonna be giving us free lunch and dinner every day. Come on, like give us the sign and we'll believe in you. Show us, meet our needs and we'll believe in you. And Jesus was saying, you're you're not really believing. What does it mean to really believe? Like theologians have helped us, has opened this word up to us to believe that is used 95 times in this gospel. You you see the way it's broken down here and and, and you you study this in the census notitia. uh, These are fun words to say. Like you wanna write these down like, okay, so let, let's just take pause right here real quick. John chapter six can be a very controversial chapter. Okay, has anyone ever gotten into a predestination free will argument before? Okay, we ain't got time for all that, right? Like if, if you wanna talk about mortification, vivification, soteriology, if you wanna talk about all of these like big words and like all of these things that people typically get hung up on, that, that's another time, set up a time, we'll grab some coffee and we'll, we'll have like a five and a half hour brief discussion about this. But, but, but to understand that, that, that Jesus is making a point here that, that everyone agrees, we have to respond to the truth. How deeply do we respond to the truth? Do we really believe? Do you know? Are you confident? Do you know that you believe in this truth that Jesus is presenting? There's one level of belief, this this emotional belief, and and we are an emotional people, much more so than, than they were back in Jesus's times. Our culture, like our younger generations, like before our frontal lobe is fully formed, which is, you know, 17 for women and 33 for guys, like whatever it is. Before the frontal lobe is completely formed, we are mainly emotional beings. And there is this emotional response to truth. Yes, that meets a felt need. And most of the people that were around Jesus, they they were getting to this point. There was a felt need that they said, you know what, Jesus, what you're saying does appeal to me. I do believe emotionally in what you're saying. But Jesus was challenging, "Has, has that belief gone a little further to your mind? Do you fully comprehend? Are you thinking about the implications it's more than just your heart, it's, it's your mind as well. Like, is your mind getting around what it means for me to make this claim that I am the bread of life? And that's where some people were sort of, I don't know, you're gonna have to explain that a little further, which we're gonna get into. But all leading to the end of this chapter where, where Jesus says, all right, now, now there's the, the, the heart emotional belief, there's this mind belief, but there's this all-encompassing will Like, are you committing to the claims that I'm making? Are you stepping into it? Are you placing your life on it? Are you fully believing, resting yourself on this train more than just emotions, more than just your mind, but you're placing your whole life on this claim? That's what it means to believe and how you respond to this truth. And that's what began to shake these people. So they started to have this conversation. What does it mean to believe? In what are we believing? What does it mean, Jesus, for you to be the bread of life, the truth, the seal? Notice how many times Jesus comes back and says, truly, truly, which he's saying, truth, truth, right here. This is a truth. So listen to the truth of what Jesus says. All that the Father has given to me Lean back one up to verse 32. Jesus then said, truth, truth, I say to you, 
It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now, we've talked a little bit about that, right? About Jesus giving abundant life to the world and what that abundance looks like. It's a quality of life. It's a vibrancy of life. It's a fullness of life. Not just heart beating, lungs breathing, but, but there's a, qual- a quantitative, qualitative assessment that you can look at your life and know that I am stepping into abundant life. I have found enough in Jesus. So they said to him, sir, sir, give us this bread. If this satisfaction is available, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Does that sound familiar at all? Has Jesus used these words before? Over and over again leading up here, you think back to the woman at the well. Do you remember that sermon? You remember reading that? He sits down with this woman and talks about what it means for Jesus to be the answer for all of life's satisfaction, all of life's thirsts. The feeding of the 5,000, he was addressing to them, this is what it means for me to be satisfaction. I can't get no. Like every time I say that word, I think of that. But, but I also think of that because it's reflective of people's hearts. The reason why Jesus continues to come back here is because so many people would look at him and say, I can't get no satisfaction. I try and I try and I try. But that's because they don't look to Jesus for the satisfaction. They look in all of these other areas. And we've talked so much about that and how Jesus is enough. In your hearts, do you hear what Jesus is saying right here? Truth. Truth. I am satisfaction do you look anywhere else how do you answer that question do you believe that he is the only satisfying bread of life because that's what he was asking the people and as we continue to reading, he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. They will always be in me. They will always find life in me. They will always find abundant life in me. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have in that moment, right now, starting then and never ending eternal life. And I will raise him up on that last day. Now listen, so the Jews grumbled about him. I love that it uses that word because like my stomach is grumbling right now. Like, I I typically don't eat breakfast. I don't eat on Sundays until, like, I'm done preaching. I get too nervous and just get all, like, nazi ozzy and just, like, I just, I've got to wait till later. My stomach is grumbling because it needs food. It wants food. It wants to be satisfied. So here the truth, the true bread has been presented to the people, and the people grumbled about him because he said, I am the satisfying bread that comes down from heaven. And they say, They said, is this not Jesus, the son of who? Joseph. They didn't believe the rumors. They didn't believe the divinity of who Jesus claimed to be. They didn't believe that he was the bread sent from heaven miraculously, born of a virgin, to display himself to the world, to be the satisfaction of the world. Is this not Joseph or Jesus, the son of Joseph? My kids went to middle school with this guy. Like we know who Joseph was. We know who Mary was. We know the father. We know the mother. How does he say now, I have come down from heaven? How does he make this claim? They grumbled because they looked to him and they said, you know what, Jesus, you are claiming to be the only source of satisfaction, 
but I've got all these other areas that I'm really used to running to. And they grumbled. One of the most insane things to watch, and I've watched it all through my ministry, both in adult and in youth ministry, is to watch people cut in, caught in the middle and treat Jesus as half a loaf of satisfaction. You watch, you watch people come to church and try to dedicate parts of their life and then they run into the world and they try to balance these two things where I'm gonna like run to Jesus sometimes for satisfaction and then I'm gonna run to the world in so many other areas for satisfaction and they try to do this balancing act as if it were possible at all. To believe is to commit to Jesus as satisfaction. Do you recognize these, these pictures? The artist is Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh. I love art, I love art history, and, and, and I like Vincent Van Gogh a lot. Did you know that his grandfather was a preacher? Did you know that, that Vincent's father was a preacher? Did you know that for a short while, Vincent Van Gogh was a preacher. He was trying to follow his father's footsteps and, and he was trying to wrestle with, with faith and, and belief in Jesus and a lot of it comes out in his art. People say that he used yellow to reflect hope and redemption in Jesus. And you look at his early art like Starry Night and you don't see a lot of yellow. At that time in his life, Vincent van Gogh was, was struggling and wrestling with a lot of things. He, he had a belief in Jesus, but he was running to so many other things for satisfaction. So Jesus, there, there's some things where, where I, I'm trying to reckon you. I I'm, I'm, I'm reckon I'm gonna go to Sunday morning church. I, I reckon I'll think of you a couple of times during the day. But I'm gonna turn to Women, he was severely addicted and codependent on other people's opinion and looked for women to, to give him affirmation. There's a time in his life where his diet consisted of coffee, caffeine, absinthe, alcohol, and no food. Not a healthy diet. He would run to all of these things and for so long he tried to balance these two things and what Vincent van Gogh is most known for is his insanity. And you see this play out throughout his life and I can't think of a better picture of, of most of us and a better picture for the crowd that was standing before Jesus because he was looking at them, he was like, you are insane if you think you can treat me as a half a loaf of satisfaction. I am the only bread that can satisfy. Why would you run anywhere else? Define the relationship. Do you run to Jesus? Is he your only source of satisfaction? What are the other things that you look to and, and, and how do you, you, you just press pause and respond to this truth that Jesus is claiming and, and change your attention and, and divert all of your affections to him and allow him to free you to experience all the other things in life. He wants to be the only bread of satisfaction. And then Jesus goes on to continue to clarify. That is his first truth, truth, I am the bread Claim, truth, truth, I am the bread that satisfies. And then he goes on to say, say this, Jesus answered them, do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. Now that's one of those controversial verses that kind of like spin people out of control. But to really understand what John was saying here, what Jesus was saying here, you need to, where else does John use these words? Where else does he use this word draw? The only other place that he uses the word draw is in John chapter 12. Let me, let me read this to you real quick. John 12, starting in verse 32. Actually, starting in verse 30, Jesus answered them. 
This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So when Jesus uses this word draw, what is he talking about? What you're going to see as we continue to open this up and as we continue to read, here Jesus isn't talking about just being the bread that satisfies. The man, manna was given to the people so that they could eat and be satisfied. Now Jesus changes his attention and says, not only am I the bread that satisfies, but I am also the only bread that saves. And when he speaks of drawing people to him, he is specifically talking about the method that God has chosen to use his son lifted up on a cross to die once and for all to establish a new covenant with his people that through his blood, through his sacrifice, all men may be saved. The attention here doesn't go on who's in, who's out. It goes to Jesus lifted up. God will draw all men to him through his son being lifted up. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets. Again, Jesus is speaking very clearly here. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. That is a direct quote from Isaiah 54, verse 13. Write that down off to the side there. What is God teaching people? Jesus refers to Isaiah chapter 54. God will teach all men these things, which is summarizing Isaiah 52 and 53. You go back and you read these prophecies. Isaiah 52 says this, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was was so marred beyond human resemblance and his form beyond that that children of mankind so he could sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told, then they will see. What is Isaiah 52 speaking of? Jesus being exalted, Jesus being crucified. Jesus drawing all men to himself. And then again in Isaiah chapter 53, it says, no form or majesty did he have that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and yet we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him, the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, we are healed. Listen to what is being quoted here. Listen to what is being said Jesus is moving from satisfaction to salvation. and He is saying there is an exclusive claim to salvation. I will raise him up. It is written in the prophets and they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from God. He has seen the father. And truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that the one may eat of it and not die. Jesus is making a very exclusive claim here. He said, truth, truth, I am the only bread that satisfies and truth truth. I am the only bread that saves. Both of these statements to the people he was speaking to was incredibly offensive and shocking. To the Jews and the, the, those in the Sanhedrin that were using Judaism to satisfy themselves, to abuse the temple courts, to gain riches on earth, Jesus was saying, no, you are wrong. 
I am the only source of satisfaction. To the other Jews, they were trying to earn their way into heaven. They were trying to use the methods of religion, use the word of God to attain, to earn, to establish themselves. He was looking at them and he says, guess what? You cannot do it. There is only one salvation. Has anyone else in here ever tried to save themselves? Every single one of us. Every single one of us. And Jesus was making an exclusive claim right here. Only I can save. And you think about that and you compare it to this bumper sticker that you see all over the place. This is what our world says. There are many different places that you can run to find salvation. And we just need to get along with one another. We need to coexist. And and it depends on what you mean by that. The world would mean all of these ways are the correct way. There are many paths, many forms of salvation that you can choose from. Just pick whatever your pleasure is and go for it. Does Jesus leave room for that? Jesus says there is salvation in no other name. There are two kinds of people, those who believe in me for salvation and those who believe something else. Now, are we supposed to to get along and love each other and be in good, healthy relationships with one another? Absolutely. Does Jesus call us to be the salt of the earth? Yes. We are to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to have friends of every nationality, of every race, of every religion, of every, like, people that are so different than us. Yes, we're supposed to be in relationship with them and be the salt of the earth to show them that there is a way. And we're also called to be the light of the world to tell them there is one place that you can find salvation and in him alone. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? How do you know if you really believe that? Do any of you watch, watch Penn and Teller? Raise your hands up. You should be ashamed of yourself. How dare you? I'm not endorsing Penn and Teller. I just want to say that up front. Um, Penn and Teller, they're these magicians in in Las Vegas. Uh, They can be wildly offensive. Um, They're both atheists. They're both devout, loud, offensive atheists. But listen to what Penn says about believing in Jesus. After a show one night, and you can, you can look up a, this, this YouTube of him actually t- sharing the story. But after, after one of his shows, uh, he was autographing things, and this gentleman comes up to him. And, and if you know anything about Penn Gillette, he's, he's six foot 13. Like, he's just a giant of a guy. Very intimidating. Very free to share his opinion. And this short man comes walking up to him after a show and, and he starts to hand something to Penn thinking, you know, Penn thinking he's gonna autograph this and looks down and sees that it's a Bible. And the man looks at him and he's kind of shaking because the man knows what he's getting into and he's just like, Penn, I really enjoyed the show. I love your magic. And I really want to give you this Bible. I know you don't believe, but I circled some scriptures and, and, and I really want you to meet Jesus. Anyone else in here brave enough to do that? That's that's pretty intense. And you would expect Penn to like turn around and just berate this guy and just shred him on social media and just like speak against him. But, But listen to what Penn says. He said, that is a good man. He really believes that Jesus is the only way to eternal life. Now listen to what Penn says. How much do you have to hate someone to know the truth and not tell them? How much do you have to hate someone to see them step into a road and a a freight train just come driving at them, this this, this truck come driving at them and you don't step out and intervene? How much do you have to hate someone not to share the truth? That man that shared with Pendulette really believed and really cared, really loved Penn. 
enough to have an awkward conversation with him. And when Jesus was looking out at that, these people, these Jews, he, he recognized that they didn't believe in Jesus as salvation, as satisfaction or as the only salvation. He saw in their hearts, he saw all the many things that they turned to for salvation. And, and today, he's doing the same thing with us. He is looking into our lives and, and he's asking, your, your life will reflect, your life will show what you believe. Do you really believe? Do you really believe that I am the only way to be saved? Because you will live your life according to what you really believe. I don't know if any of you have ever come into like a, a real near-death experience. March of 2019, if you remember, like I was in Nepal and we almost got pushed off the side of a cliff. We were driving, uh, riding this, this bus to get to the highest point in the mountain and we got caught in a mudslide that came down, hit our bus and literally pushed it. The front wheel was hanging off of a 200-foot cliff. Me and my wife like shut her down, put our heads between our knees and we both started praying, God, take care of our kids. We were convinced that we were going to die. Praise God, he held us there. We were able to escape out of the windows and we had a new relationship with the ground underneath our feet. <laughs> You ask anyone that was there, we were on the ground. Like if there was ever time to kiss the ground, it was then. I had a relationship with the ground. I didn't wanna be on shaky grounds ever again. And anytime we got in a vehicle, we asked very specific questions because we wanted to stay grounded to a firm foundation. We had a new relationship with the ground. We didn't wanna let go of the ground we told other people how great the ground was. And we warned people, if they were going up in certain areas, please be careful. Like we, we had to tell them the truth that you want to be connected to the ground. Something happens inside of you when you find the only way. You hold on to it and you talk about it. You care about those around you who are not connected to it. Your life will show what you believe. And we see this as we continue reading. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. To what extent do you believe emotionally, with your heart or with your whole self? Are you fully committed? Are you desperate? Are you holding on to? Are you connected with the only truth? Listen to how Jesus phrases this. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. You could have heard a gasp coming from this Jewish community. Your flesh is the bread that is disgusting, Jesus. Cannibalism? And here Jesus is also painting the picture, I have to die for you to eat my flesh. You could just see, you could feel people being like, all right, Jesus, you, you're the only satisfaction. You're the only salvation. You want us to eat your flesh. People were backing up. People were astonished. People were offended. The Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truth, truth, one and only truth I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now underline these words because up until him, you can go back and you can circle all the times that Jesus said eat, but now he changes that word and says this, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, abides 
in me and I in him. Jesus changed the word. Earlier he was saying eats and, and, and P-H-A-G-E and phagen. That's the word for eat and it just means just the way we casually eat, to eat anything and to, to eat as humans do. We, we eat how many of you wait until you are absolutely out of your mind, starving like the people on that TV show alone who've gone like 30 days without real food? That's how you eat. Or how many of you are like, oh, it's, it's 12 o'clock. How many of you looking at, it's 10 o'clock, man. It's second breakfast. Like it's, I'm on a schedule. How many of you have a schedule? Coffee at a time, breakfast at a time, second breakfast, 12 o'clock, it's time for lunch, take a break. Go to work, dinner, man, I've got to be home by such and such a time. You eat when it's convenient to you. And that's what Jesus was saying here. He's like, there's some of you that that eat on me just when it's convenient. I want those who feed on me. I'll I'll buy that word, write the word trogos, T-R-O-G-O-S. That is an animalistic feeding you ever try to get in your dog's dish when it's eating its food? It snarls at you. Worse than your two-year-old, right? You don't mess with an animal when it's eating because they're eating for survival. They know that this bowl is not getting dropped at any other time. Or out in the wild, when they find their food, they pounce on it, they jump on it, they eat it to its full because they don't know when the next survival meal is coming. Do you feel the difference there? Jesus was saying, I want people who want to feed on me, hold on to me, recognize that I am their only hope for salvation. Animalistically jumping into my flesh, consuming me is the only way that they can be satisfied. Jumping in and drinking my blood as if that is the only way that they could find salvation. I am looking for the desperate. I am looking for those who's willing to cast off everything else in this world and look only to me. Is that you? Jesus said, as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread that the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Then the next thing we see is when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Jesus looked out and he had the final DTR and he was just like, are you offended? Is this, is this too much for you? Then we can change some of my words. Don't worry about it. Like, like we've got you know, half a year on your digital screen. Like you can just copy, paste, rewrite some things. Like it, if that's too much for you, if that's too offensive, let's just change some things. No, Jesus wanted them to be offended. Jesus wanted them to be struck. Jesus wanted them to hear, I am the only. Are you offended at this? Jesus looked at them later and said, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer worked with him. That phrase, turned back, is the same words that were used to reflect upon the Jews in the wilderness that turned back to go to Egypt, who in their hearts turned away from God, followed him no longer. And Jesus was looking at these people and he knew I don't think Jesus picked and chose and like, you know, drove certain people away intentionally and kept those that he lied because they were a lot cuter than the other ones. Like, I don't think Jesus sifted through everyone like that. Jesus looks at us and he knows. He looks at our lives and he knows because our lives will preach often what our words won't. Right now he's looking at us 
and he knows. And then it gets even more uncomfortable where Peter says something beautiful, but then you see something. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed. We have believed that the the, the way that verb is parsed, it's like we chose to believe back then, we presently believe and no matter what comes tomorrow, we will continue to believe. That's what Peter is saying here. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You are the bread of satisfaction. You are the bread of salvation. You are the only way. And Jesus answered them and said, did I not choose you, the 12? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him, just like these other people turned and walked away. In the same way, Jesus, from the very beginning, listen, I want to be absolutely clear here. I do not believe that you can lose your salvation. I 100% absolutely do not believe that. But here, Jesus is showing, Jesus is demonstrating from the very beginning, I saw Judas Iscariot step in and from the very beginning, Judas had his eyes set on the money. He wanted to be the treasurer. He wanted to count the money. He got upset when I broke the jar and and, and we could have used the money in other ways and he was finally betrayed for money. From the very beginning, Jesus looked and he saw Judas' heart, that Judas was never really in it. There was always something else that Judas was drawing satisfaction from, something that Judas was looking to for his salvation. From the very beginning to the very end, Jesus knew that Judas never responded to Jesus. But how uncomfortable is it for the reader? When I read, I always put myself there as one of the 12 And now we are faced with a really uncomfortable question, the really uncomfortable reality that many of us sitting here, even though we are always around Jesus, we are always hearing Jesus, we are always seeing Jesus. The point of this passage is magnified here with Peter saying, I have, I will, I will always believe in you. And Judas, who even though seeing and saying and doing and from the very beginning, never chose to believe. And that's where we find ourselves today. Do you believe? Do you look to him as your only satisfaction, as your only salvation? We're taking communion today, and I'm sorry if that freaks you out because I know it's not the first of the month and it's like way off schedule. But as we were, as I was preparing for this and I was reading the words like Jesus is talking about his body and his blood, how can we not take communion? But it's also for a time for us to hear the words of Jesus. For us to place ourselves as one of the 12 and ask ourselves, do we really believe? Communion is not just for everyone to take. That's what Jesus was saying here. I'm looking for the desperate. Jesus was saying, I'm looking for those who really want to believe. To lay it all down. To follow me. So today we didn't hand it out as you came in and just give it to everyone today as the worship team comes out. As we begin singing this song, this is a time for you to reflect. Jesus tells us to do this on a regular basis so that for us once a month or or right now, we can stop and we can look and we can ask ourselves, are you really the bread that satisfies? Do I really believe that only you are the blood that saves. So as they sing, I I want you to ask yourself this question, a very honest question. If you believe, step up, step in, take it, bring it back to your seats and we'll take it in a little bit. But if you don't believe, 
then it's time for another conversation. And we'll be available after the service over here to, to, to pray with you, to talk with you, because we want you to step into belief. But you've got to ask yourself, am I willing to go beyond emotions, beyond just getting my mind around it? Am I getting to the point of being a disciple saying, Jesus, I will always follow you. I will build my life around you, the only name that saves. Contemplate, think. And if you're ready to receive the body and the blood, come up. We have the plates up here in the back. We've it's all over the room. You can find a place to get this, come back to your seat, and then we'll take it before the end of the song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
to our satisfaction. Jesus said, I am the only bread that satisfies and my body was broken for you. Jesus, today we turn to you and you alone for all the satisfaction in our lives. Jesus, we take this bread and eat. Jesus, the only name that saves. His blood, the only avenue for forgiveness. Jesus, thank you. There's nothing we can do. We are saved only by what you have done for us. And Jesus, we are desperate for you. Thank you for your blood poured out for us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being faithful and obedient in your tithes and offerings. You can give online, on the app, in person, and by mail by sending a check to Cascade Office here in Monroe. Remember to like this video, subscribe to our channels, and most importantly, make sure to share this video so that other people can hear the good news of Jesus Christ as well. Thanks for being part of the Cascade family and hope you have an awesome weekend.